Sorry about that. Go ahead, George. Okay, great. Uh, we'll try this again. Thank you, everyone online, for bearing with us. Um, all the only thing you really missed was the roll call. Um, everyone is here apart from Jason Pressman, who had a uh, sudden conflict, so he is absent. Um, with that out of the way, moving to item two on the agenda, the oral communications for items not on the agenda. Uh, there's no one in the room who'd like to speak. I see Rita's hand is up online. Rita, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. Uh, really appreciate you having this meeting. Uh, I, I know our new town manager has only started with us um, not too long, but uh, there's lots of financial information that we have been promised for many years and have not received. And I know that things are in the works to, um, to be more responsive and, and more clear about uh, the status of things. But at the same time, we're, we're waiting. And my worry or my question is, you know, it doesn't look like we're applying for many grants or uh, special monies. Is this because we don't have the financials to to back it up? But I'm very glad we're meeting. I, I hope that uh, this particular group meets more on a on a regular basis moving forward. There's lots of talk. There's lots of plans. But uh, this is the first one in quite some time. And you have uh, highly capable people on this particular committee. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see some of their skills being used to work towards uh, solving some of the financial problems in our town that is um, resident based in helping solve things. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rita. Uh, I see Betsy has her hand up. Betsy? Yes, hi. Thank you, uh, Chairman Savage. I wanted to thank, um, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and publicly thank committee member Bill Urban for agreeing to visit the Open Space Committee earlier this month. Um, though the visit was not in his capacity as a finance committee member, uh, Bill's 25 years of service afforded him and us a, a high level perspective and a more grounded and nuanced understanding of of the Open Space Fund related revenue streams and investments. So again, Bill agreed to join us as a resident, but it really did serve the spirit of cross committee purpose and cooperation. So my sincere thanks to you, Bill, and to, to George for managing the arrangement. And then briefly and separately, um, this is a meeting I've been patiently awaiting and so has much of the community and I'm very sorry I'll have to leave at the half hour mark, um, but thank you all for getting us to this place. Um, I look forward to moving together collectively as a town. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, anyone else online in the room? Okay, uh, moving to item three, I think we just have uh, a couple of announcements that didn't make it into the agenda and I'll uh, hand it over to Lucy. My announcement is that today is my last meeting as a finance committee member. And I just want to say that I'm grateful to have served on the finance committee in particular with uh, such kind and intelligent people. And it's been great learning about how the town works. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of people who would want to be on this committee. So I'm going to let other folks have uh, have fun with it. Thank you. All right, well, uh, on behalf of the whole committee, I'd like to thank Lucy for her service. And um, uh, Jason Pressman has separately told me that he's looking to step down in the future, not at this meeting, which he could not attend, but um, is looking to pull back for uh, just being overscheduled. So what this means for the public is that we have a couple of openings coming up. And um, if anyone is interested in considering the Finance Committee, please reach out and um, either contact me or someone at the town and we we can um, talk about it. With that, uh, we move on to approval of the minutes, item four. Um, has everyone reviewed um, the minutes from the last meeting in end of November? Do I hear a motion to approve? Okay. Um, so Yes, sir. Uh, I 
that we last signed by you, right? So, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so I, I took minutes up until 425, and, and then Michelle took it until 436. Okay. So yeah. when we said acting, that, that's. Well, we, we, we had sort of a hybrid um, secretary there. Okay. We had 11 minutes in Michelle. That was the cause of the um, unclear statement. Thank you. With, with that clarified, do I have a motion to approve? I, I so move. Okay, second. second. Uh, in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, minutes are adopted. Great. Um, we will now move on to new business. Um, this is a very exciting meeting because we get to um, hear some of the uh, early results of um, financial improvements that Sharif and his team have been putting into place. And I think we're going to hear, hear first about uh, all things property tax related in terms of revenue. Uh, and we have a um, guest uh, who's a consultant to the town who will be speaking to us. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Sharif to introduce uh, Paula. Thank you, George. Thank you, Finance Committee. Good to see you all. Um, this is an exciting meeting for me to for be able to, to share with you all that we've been doing um, as staff. And as not only the public has mentioned, you heard a public comment earlier about really getting into the meat of what we're doing, not just talk or the plan. Today, we're going to share with you what we're doing, where we're at, some of the timelines, what we're looking at in the future. And so a three-pronged approach for today is that you're going to be hearing from Paula Cohn, Paula is the president of HDL um, Cohn, who she's basically the expert in property tax up and down the state. And we did not have a contract for outside analysis for property tax before. So this property tax analysis that you'll hear today from Paula is new to Portola Valley, and you haven't had the opportunity to get that before. Um, I'm very familiar with her work and her work with CSMFO and other um, towns and cities. And she is the, basically, like I said, the expert. And um, when she does a, does a deep dive for not only Portola Valley and other towns, um, it really does um, lay out where we're at. And so in discussion with that, I did um, contract out with Paula and um, HDL Cone to be able to have this ongoing in the future. So we'll be hearing property tax analysis um, every year moving forward. That's one piece is looking at our one of our biggest revenue streams. The biggest revenue stream is property tax. What are the trends? What, what are the challenges? And you hear... Um, a basic big challenge that we'll be facing in property tax moving forward. The second piece is I will be um, asking Heather um, Rodin from Christian Company to tell you exactly where we're at with our audit, our review, what they've done in the last three or four months. And then I'll take up the last piece, which is basically laying out the fiscal viability or sustainability for the town and enlisting your help as the finance committee moving forward and how that ties in not only to this year, but talking about a three-year plan. And what I re would really like the town and finance committee to help me focus on to get us um, to a viable model, if you will, financially. So um, starting with that, I wanted to introduce Paula, who has prepared a presentation for us today on our property tax. And I'll let her take over from here. And thank you, uh, thank, you. thank you, Sharif. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I am going to share my screen. Paula, if you don't mind, give a one-minute um, presentation of yourself. Introduce yourself and your expertise, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. I spent 24 years in municipal government. Uh, started out as a recreation uh, parks and rec director. Uh, became assistant city manager and uh, worked in a single city, the city of Lawndale, a city that's two square miles and, in my opinion, probably never should have been a city. Uh, it became a city because the topless uh, bars were encroaching and the public decided <laughs> that they were going to stop the topless bars, which ended up being a free speech issue and they couldn't stop the bars. So uh, an interesting city. Uh, I spent my uh, the first 24 years of my uh, professional career there and have spent the last 35 years doing property tax work. Uh, right now we've got about 270 of the cities in the state of California. So more than half of the cities in the state are under contract uh, for us to provide them with property tax analysis, trends, budget forecasting, and uh, generally to be your staff. You know, property taxes, if they were simple, I wouldn't have a job. And if a staff member has got a question, rather than them trying to reinvent the wheel, we encourage them to contact us, let us help them out. 
So today I'm going to talk about two things. One is uh, where we are in fiscal year 23-4 and also where we are headed for 24-5. And I generally start my, my presentation, am I? Ah, I generally start with the timeline because um, I think it's, it's important to understand that property taxes are a lagging indicator of what is happening in your town. Uh, I'm going to be looking at next fiscal year, 24-25, the timeline, because we are well into the current fiscal year and your, your focus is really on where do we go from here. The role for 24-25 was leaned on January 1st, 2024. So for something to appear on the roll that's going to be taxed for cap for fiscal year 24-5, it happened in calendar year 2023. So properties that sold last year, properties that added new construction, properties that burned down, all of that mix of events that happened in 2023 are going to be what we see taxed next year in 2024. Between January 1st and June 30th, the role is with the assessor of San Mateo County. He and his staff are applying role changes, corrections, prop eights, a number of events that happen uh, right after the first of the year to prepare the role. And at the end of, the, of June, that role is wrapped up and sent to the auditors. The auditors and the assessors do not have interlinking databases because the assessor's role changes every single day. And the auditor needs something to tax. So as of the end of June, they get that role. That role is in their hands for two months, July and August. They apply the direct assessments, the voter approved debt, extend the role. And that role is then at the end of August sent to the tax collector. Their job is to print and mail the tax bills to the taxpayers. So by the time the taxpayers receive their tax bills next September, we are already nine months down the road from the events that happened and you haven't received any money yet from the property tax bills. The bills are due in November, delinquent in December and the first payment and then in February, delinquent in April, 2025, the second payment. Payments are made to the tax collector. The tax collector tells the auditor, we received this much money and the auditor then allocates the revenue to all the taxing agencies. So again, when you receive your last dollar in July or August of 2025, you are more than a year and a half down the road from the values that were driving the revenues that you received for that fiscal year. So in general, there is a lag of 12 to 18 months from something happening and you receiving revenue on it. To look at the historical values in Portela Valley over the past 30 years, you will notice that you've had a couple of years where you had really large growth. The average growth that we have seen over the past 30 years has been 6.68%, as you see that on the bottom line. I wanna point out that the year that you had 19.11% growth, the difference between the values in 2001 and 2001 was roughly $230 million. If you look at the value change this year between 23 and 22, that change was $230 million. So as you have increased your value over the past 20 years, it takes you a whole lot more to get that same percentage that you had many, many years ago. We look at the, uh, the overall percentage change. There have been 11 years where you've had growth of 7% or greater, six years of growth between, uh, or less than 5%, and the other 12 years have been between six, five, six, and 7%. Uh, during the Great Recession, we saw a little bit of decline, pretty flat. You didn't have the negativity that we have seen in many of the other cities. Uh, you know, where we typically see a 2% change, not always 2%, uh, uh, having a flat is certainly better than a negative. And the values doubled between 1994-5 and 2003-4 in this period. And they doubled again between 2000, this should be 3-4. See, 
I could look at this every stinking day and not see that error. And when I get here and start talking, that's when it pops out. Uh, so between 2003, four and 15, 16, you also doubled your value. And the growth over the past five years has been 27.8%. I point that out because this kind of growth that you had back here and certainly back here when you had lower values and it didn't take as much to get a 1% increase. You know, as you get a, to be ha to have more value in the city, it's a little bit heavier heft to get that 1% growth year over year. Another uh, report that does also look at a five-year history is shown, and I, I just put this report in to show what your growth has been over the past five years and what the County of San Mateo's growth has been in that same period of time. You have underperformed the county in three of the past four years. Uh, you know, other parts of the county, Menlo Park has Facebook Meta, uh, San Carlos has a lot of biotech. So you don't have the same mix of those kinds of properties. So don't get in the doldrums if you don't match the county, you're doing good for the town of Portola Valley. To look at a comparison of your values with the rest of the cities in San Mateo County, you'll note that this is, this is in um, value order or, or percent change order. And it certainly doesn't take Brisbane as much to grow one percentage point as it takes you. you know, they've got roughly $900 million less in value than you do. Uh, or you know, looking at a city like Atherton, Again, they've got $15 billion in value. It's gonna take them more to get up a percentage point. So the larger the city, the bigger the, the, the challenge is to get one percentage point growth. So the average in 2023 was 6.8% in the county and the median was 6%. And Paula, if I may, I'll interrupt every once in a yeah. while. Um, the finance committee, the community will all get these slides. We'll post them afterwards. Just yes. because it was the first time we wanted to make sure Paula went through them in detail yeah. and, then we'll post and I can go through and make that correction before <laughs> before you distribute them thank you this um these reports are the, the, the reports that we'll get every year and these are um, very fascinating when you see these cities change over time and who's building and who's doing what some city will be nine and ten percent growth and they'll go down to three percent because they had a burst whether it's a Facebook burst or a Google burst or different pieces so over time you'll be able to see the trends and it's very interesting how the different cities play out every year Exactly. You know, you had cities like uh, Menlo Park, which did really well before the pandemic, but when everybody started vacating their properties and working from home, we saw a lot of appeals and some reductions there. So, uh, you know, Menlo Park still only grew 5%, where you grew almost 5.4. Okay. Oh, uh, there's a raised hand. Does somebody have a question? Uh, David Cardinal. Quick question. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, this is amazing. I think it's wonderful and I'm glad we're getting it. I have a, a statistical question. How much does this relate to the rate of property turnover? Because I assume the major increase in property tax is when people buy homes. And I'm just stick wondering around. if there's a correlation. Yeah, stick around. I will show you that in just a minute. Thanks for asking the question. Uh, in fact, I can show you a part of that right now. Uh, the uh, the town of Portola Valley grew 236 million three seventy four seven forty six between 2022 and 2023. To look at what caused that growth, the first element here, and by the way, it's 5.39%. About 2% of your growth came from the properties doing nothing more but sitting where they were didn't add new construction, didn't sell, and got the 2% CPI that's granted per Prop 13. After Prop 13 was adopted, 2% of the CPI, whichever is less, is granted every year to properties that do not sell or add new construction. So that was approximately 36.7% of your total growth, or one point, almost 2% of your 5%. The next item are properties that sold last year. And this is an answer in part to your question. So properties that sold last year added $119.8 million to your bottom line. That was 50.7% of your growth. So again, the properties that sold in 2022 that are reflected in 23-4 added 2.7 of your 5.3% year-over-year growth. 
That's the big item here. And I will tell you before we get there, a little spoiler here, you are not going to see that for 24-5. The next item has to do with completed new construction. Both residential and non-residentials are shown here at about four tenths of a percentage point. So if you did if you did not have any new construction, you would have just seen 5% growth. It would have whacked off this particular portion of that. So that growth is good to see. It doesn't happen every year. We look at completed new construction, not building permits pulled because a building permit does not necessarily mean that somebody started or completed a project. Prop eight reductions, I won't, uh, spend much time on this, but when property values go down during the pandemic or some other element of uh, properties are not selling for as much as they sold for last year, the assessor is required by law to put properties at their market value. And we saw a little bit of that happen because of the interest rate hikes and people not bidding up properties in late 2022 and all of 2023. And the other item I wanna talk about is uh, other changes, which are sort of our hodgepodge. We do have properties that uh, do not have a sale recorded, but there is an increase in value. Sometimes that's delayed. Exemptions like uh, nonprofits or churches that have to be applied every year are not always in sync with the data when we receive it. Appeals that were reduced and then restored, we will find those also in this pot and personal property additions, uh, unsecured role. Our estimated revenue for 2034, $2,884,484. $2, you initially were told by the auditor's office that you would be getting 705,924 in ERAF, I mean, pardon me, in VLF, but because there was a shortfall in ERAF, you're going to receive uh, roughly 404,000 because this amount is the shortfall. And I have, I'm gonna talk about that at the very end, I'll get through this and I'm gonna go into the weeds a little bit to talk about that. Uh, your 1% breakdown is noted here. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked, uh, at least uh, Sharif and I have talked that the city receives roughly 4.3 cents before ERAF is applied. And then there is a shift that is taken away and that is noted as the ERAF uh, for Portola Valley. Uh, the ERAF is uh, sort of sucked out of your revenue by the county. Uh, they know how much that grows every year, they subtract it, and you are left with the balance. This is before your TEA and your excess ERAF. There is a file, and the county does not change that file that this comes from, this started back in uh, 1978, when Prop 13 was adopted, that's when you were receiving roughly 4.3 cents. And then in 1992 and three, when the ERAF hits happened, there was a shift away from you. So Paula, when we talk yes. to the town and residents say, I pay my property tax and I pay tons of money and all that money goes to the town, where's the money going? Not this so much, slide. right? Right. This is the slide that you show them. It's four <laughs> exactly. cents on the dollar. You look right. at and the elementary school, the high school, the junior college, county education, and that's probably all of the educational services. They're probably getting roughly 50% of the tax dollar. The county, uh, oh, and all of these ERAF shares also go to the county, to the, the schools, K through 12. Uh, however, you've got so many basic aid schools that the money comes back to you as excess ERAF. And again, I will walk you through that in just a second. So that four cents on the dollar is what comes to the town. That's our revenue, that $2.8 million. Yep. Other cities that have a lot of growth or have a hospital or have a community college or have other things in different areas. And because of their growth, they might get 10% on the dollar. They might get 13% on the dollar. So I, as finance director, depending on where you go as a city or a town, your property tax revenue coming from this dollar paid for property tax could be wildly different, which it is. So we're four cents, four and a half cents, 4.7 cents on the dollar, as opposed to another town or city that might be 10, 11, 13 cents on the dollar. And so well, this is an important all, slide for the community. Yeah, that all goes time. back to 1978. After 1978, when Prop 13 was adopted, 
uh, before Prop 13 was adopted, a city, let's say you needed $4 million in revenue, the county would tell you what your value was going to be estimated. The city would divide that revenue by the value and you would get a digit, you know, a, a, a four or five digit mill rate. And you would charge that mill rate on every piece of property in town unless it was a government owned or exempt. And when Prop 13 was adopted, it kick that to the curb and taxed properties at 1%. And the auditors were then given legislation to go through and look at what every taxing agency received in a given tax rate area. And this tax rate area is 19,000. And you would receive that relative amount of the revenue going forward. For instance, if a school district received 20 cents of the 20 percent of all the revenue collected in those three years, they would get a 20 cent share. And the school district is pretty pure. So this is what they were getting before. The high school district was roughly getting 15 cents. And this worked uh, worked fine until it didn't. And we'll talk about ERAF, and as I said in a minute, which is kind of a, a complex thing. But, uh, you know, cities often say, I want more. How can I get more? Well, the dollar is the dollar. The only way you can get more is to have somebody else give up some of theirs, and school districts are prohibited from giving up any of theirs. So that puts you back to the fire district. They're not going to want to talk about giving up some of their money. The county, they do health and safety and, and uh, courts. And they're going to say, well, what do you want to take over? You want a penny or two cents? Do you want to take over the, the health services? So they've got a mandated responsibility. And so a lot of these other entities are getting less than you. And they're going to say, we don't have anything to give you. So this is your share. The only way to get more is to go to the voters and get them to approve a direct assessment uh, or a special tax. And that's that's an uphill struggle as well. So this is the single largest tax rate area, as I mentioned, 19-000. If we look at all the tax rate areas in Portola Valley and weight them, and you'll notice that you've got a Crescent Avenue Maintenance District, A, B, C, and D. So there's a different mix of these set taxing entities in every uh, all of the tax rate areas in the city, town. And so that's why every every tax rate area has a little bit different share of, of your 1%. Some have got 4.6, some have got 3.8. It just depends on where it sits and who plays uh, in that particular tax rate area. Your share in comparison to the other cities and the county are noted here. I do want to point out that Colma, 1.72, they've got either police or fire. They used to be a client. They're not any longer. So that's what the, the general fund related share is in general. Uh, but Colma, uh, Portola, Woodside, and Half Moon Bay are the no low property tax cities. And there was a TEA that was legislated in 1988 that your auditor, chose not to implement and was caught. And after 2005, six, there was a negotiated agreement where you were paid back uh, for a four year period, the statutory um, amount uh, that, that uh, was uh, owed you and then on a go forward basis. So you are actually receiving about six cents of the tax dollar when the TEA is applied. But again, County never changes this file. The TEA is done on a separate calculation. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, this may also uh, play into how much of the revenue uh, that comes to you comes from properties that are selling. If we go back and we look at the time before the Great Recession, and then the year before we started seeing the declines in values, a median price of a single family home in the town of Portola Valley was two million two eighty nine, and uh, the year before it was a million nine. You can see that last year there what the growth was before we started the slide. Uh, you kind of came back a little bit in two thousand seven and eight, and then you cascaded until two thousand and thirteen when you finally surpassed that number that you had up above. So. Um, this shows the number of sales, single family homes uh, that happened in each of the years, what the average and the median price was and the median price percent change year over year. 
once we get to 2021, and that was uh, the first year after we came out of the pandemic, out of our caves and people started looking to buy again, uh, when, when that happened, uh, there was a lot more on the market. Uh, and we did see that there was a little bit of an increase in the number of sales. Calendar year 2022 is what is driving the 23-24, again, current fiscal year. You can see that there were 40 sales for the prior year there were 70. So you not quite half as many sales in 22 as you had in 21. However, again, we had a huge run up in the prices in 2021. In 2023, prices fell. So you're all over the place. You have a lot of unique priced homes. Uh, you know, you're not like uh, a, a community that might have a lot of uh, new homes in a track and those those homes are, are uh, pretty much alike all the other 200 homes in that track. In this case, uh, this tends to be a little more volatile because you can have a lot of lower value homes come to market this year and higher value homes come to market the two prior years and you'll have a decline. So it depends on what kinds of homes are coming to market, what the economy is like, what the interest rates are like, all that plays into this. So for 24-5, we are looking at fewer sales, not that many fewer, but certainly less than you had last year and a median price point that's down 3.2%. What that looks like in San Mateo County, and you're not alone, my friends, uh, the city of Colma had four sales last year, and they had an increase. They had 10 sales the year before. Uh, Foster City had a slight increase, and San Bruno was flat. Everybody else went, went down year over year, and countywide, the median sale price was down 2.69%. And what does this mean? And I know this is a messy slide. I'm not gonna go through all the numbers and you're saying, thank goodness. Uh, I do wanna point out that last year, again, the data that's driving 23-4 was calendar year 22. Last year, there were 41 total sales and the difference between the original value, the value that was taxed in, in the prior, in that year, and the property set the value of that sale. So the increase of the sale value over the original value was a, an increase of $119.8 million. So that means that the number that we saw in that first report that I showed you that showed an increase of 2.73% was $119 million. In 23, and this is what's going to roll into 24 or four or five, there were 38 sales. Your, your non-single family actually sold for about half as much as the value on the roll. It could have been a vacant lot. And the additive next year is going to be 74.1 million, and that is the equivalent of 1.60%. So if you receive 2% in the CPI and 1.60% in transfers of ownership, you're at 3.6%, not 5.6%. Four that you had this year, 5.39. So you're already starting out lower. The sale additive that we had in 2023 was the lowest that we've seen since 2015. But you'll notice after 2015, the next year it doubled. So uh, I don't get too mired in this. Uh, you know, it could have, uh, it could mean that the that are people that don't want to sell their home. Uh, because they, they have to pay a higher interest rate for a new home or just going to sit there until things even out. David, yes. A uh, quick question that might be outside of the scope of your presentation. Hey, um, but one issue that's I'm, come up. Um, I, I, yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering, uh, David, if we can hold your question until the end. And Paula, why don't you get through your presentation and I'd ask everyone online to write your questions down and then at the end we'll open it to questions. OK, you got it. Yeah, thank you. So this is what our forecast tool looks like. We we put the 2% growth. Here's your $74 million that I just showed you. We're assuming a little bit of an increase uh, rather than a decrease in the Prop 8s that could change. And so the overall growth we're showing next year is 3.84% and also 3.84% applied to your VLF in lieu. 
that uh, would generate $2.9 million in revenue, almost two point, almost $3 million in revenue. Uh, we do provide staff with uh, new construction history. Uh, you know, If you go to your building and safety and ask them to provide you with all the completed new constructions, it's going to come probably pretty close to this. Uh, if you were to use a 50% estimate of the trended trimmed average, that would grow your, your, your uh, 3.84 to 4.16. And if you were to add 75%, still uh, uh, higher than last year, but lower than two years ago, that would grow to 4.32. So not putting new construction in leaves you with a very conservative number. Putting some new construction, even if you put only 25%, is going to bolster your bottom line a little bit. Uh, okay. I mentioned when Prop 13 was adopted <clears throat> that uh, we went from a mill rate to a share of the 1%. The effective result of that was that most agencies, cities, counties, special districts, and school districts lost about 60% of their revenue. A lot of you are too young to remember Prop 13. I was working for a city when that happened. I certainly did remember it. The thing in Prop 13 that was sort of embedded was that it changed what was a local administered tax and made it a state administered tax. And so after Prop 13 was adopted and everybody was screaming, we're so poor, we're not gonna be able to do what we were doing before, the state said, hey, we've got a budget surplus. And what we're going to do is we're gonna take money from the schools and give it to the cities, counties, and special districts to kind of lessen the blow and we're going to backfill the schools with average daily attendance funds. So everybody dusts their hand and says, okay, that's great. And then in 1992, the state couldn't balance its budget. And some legislators said, hey, you remember that money we directed to the cities, counties, and special districts from schools back in 1978? That was never supposed to be permanent. We've got a way to fix our budget. We're going to take that back. And so the first year, 1992-3, they took about 9% of prior revenue and took that away. And then 1993 rolls around and the state still couldn't balance their budget. And they said, well, we really need to take back from you what we bailed you out with. And so cities on average lost about 25% of their revenue. And for you, you lost about, I think, 11, 11 cents or 0.11 of your 0.4, which is about 25%. Uh, so over time, there have been more basic aid schools, particularly in San Bernardino County. Now, ERAF was supposed to go to schools that, that needed the money that were not basic aid. But as you've uh, had more basic aid schools with the increased value of properties in San Mateo County, the county takes this basic aid, that takes this ERAF and then it can't spend it. So the first job is to give it back to you, which is what they do. But the first call on the ERAF after they've given it back to you is to pay the VLF in lieu. And what do you know? There's not enough money for that because they've given it all back to you. But the state uh, budget back in 2004 or five says you're supposed to be to get this every year. But the county of San Mateo said, but we don't have the money. We can't give it to them. We've given it back to them. So one of the legislative changes that was proposed that the governor didn't sign was not to give you your excess ERAF until after they'd taken the VLF swap. And everybody's going, well, no, 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 no. You never should have taken the ERAF in the first place because you don't need it. So that's where we are. The legislation didn't pass. There's not enough money to pay for your full VLF. And because of that, you have a shortfall after they've given you the, so you have insufficient after they've given you the excess ERAF back. So you and Mono and Alpine are the only counties right now that have got a insufficient ERAF to pay VLF. Uh, but I, I just need to show you what that looks like. You started out with 705,924. Here is the shortfall leaving you with 404. And they have done that in 22-3, 21-2, 20-21, 20-19-20. 20. Every year for the past five years, this has been what's happened. So Paul, I'm gonna stop for just a second. So okay. this is this is the deal. This is the slide for um, VLF and ERAF, and we haven't talked about it too much in detail, but for all of the um, finances that go through the cities, this is what um, 
California League of Cities is banding together to get us the funding for, for this ERAF and VLF. For years and years and years, they have told the county and the, the cities, we're not going to pay you. We're not going to give you excess ERAF. We don't have the funds. And year after year, the funds would come, but they'd come last minute. So all of these cities and towns made some sort of philosophy or budgeting philosophy. And some of them took the entire 100% and spent it. Other ones, when, uh, an example of myself as finance director, I said, I'm not going to budget 100% of ERAF because we don't know if it's coming or not. So we had a 50% rule. Everything that came in, we'd budget 50%. The other 50% was gravy, if you will, for the general fund. And different cities had different philosophies. Now, for the first time, they're saying, you are not going to get ERAF, you're not going to get VLF. And it's not budgeted at the state budget level. So it's clear we're not getting it. Whereas before, it, sometimes it would come, sometimes it wouldn't, sometimes it would be higher, sometimes it would be lower. And to Paula's slide here, you see our $301,000 shortfall. Look at the shortfalls for some of the other cities. And you'll see this in the newspaper. You'll see this in their presentations. You have you know, $6 million for one city. You have $7 million for another, $5 million. You know, we were looking at a 400,000. I know it's relative, but imagine those kind of shortfalls in the other cities. And so we literally are working on a joint letter that's gonna to go to the state on behalf of all the cities and towns fighting to get that excess ERAF vehicle license fee back, if you will. But that's point number one. And Paul is gonna talk about, you know, so we have the, the decrease in our growth and then we have our VLF shortfall and that's the the two punchlines, if you will, for Portola Valley. Right. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, I I, I put this in and I, I know it's got a lot of numbers on it. I just want to comment that you started out with 4.3 cents. And when we calculate your revenue, that would, and this is uh, two years ago, this is the last time that these auditor controller uh, provided a report. They haven't posted the 23.4 yet because the year's not over yet. So last year, if I were to have taken your value times your 4.2 cents, 4.3 cents, you would have had one, uh, $1.8 million. You would have shifted ERAF, and that would have brought your uh, value or your percentage down to 0.35. From that point, we have this additional allocation. And we've been monitoring this way back from before the data that they don't show us any longer for some reason. Uh, when the county was allocating a million seven forty nine, we had a million. We were like hundred and fifty dollars different from the county number, and we kept saying, "Where is this excess coming from? Where is this additional allocation?" And so we, th it has to be your TEA, your tax equity allocation, because you receive less than seven cents. And in 1988, the legislature said those no low cities are going to receive seven cents, and then there's going to be an ERAF shift from that. And so that's why you're receiving 6.2. So when we do our forecast, we budget it at this rate because this is what you're actually going to get. This amount is going to be TEA and it's going to be allocated to you. Uh, from that, you also have excess ERAF. If I add this excess ERAF into, into the allocated number, your percentage comes up to 6.9 uh, cents of every tax dollar. What what uh, AB 1197, that adding one cent to you got seven cents for the no low was supposed to do was to give you seven cents. It was then hit by ERAF. In reality, if you were to get 100% of your ERAF shift back, you would get seven cents. So uh, you know, someone says, why are we getting so little? You are getting so little based on the county file but the county has another file that they're using to give you this excess money that you're entitled to because you were a no-low city to get you as close as they can to seven cents. And then they have an ERAF shift that comes away from that. So uh, I worked on this last week because we've asked the county for their TEA calculation and it's crickets over there. We can't get them to provide us with anything. When we get it, it's going to be like a gold mine, and I hope we'll be able to help you out to really finally see what they're doing. Okay, I, that's that's uh, drinking from a fire hose from HDL Corn and Co. Question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paula. First, from the committee members, uh, questions, discussion. All right, o opening it to the public, I know that. Um, David Cardinal had a question and we can start there. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, this is amazing, but also scary. Um, I've 
run a company, started a company, taking corporate finance. And I don't envy any of you the job of sorting this out. Um, I have a really tactical question. One item that's come up as a bit of a controversy politically is the repeal of the portion of Prop 19 that allows residents to hand down properties to their descendants without paying an uplift in the property taxes. Now, in Portola Valley, we have an average age, which includes me increasingly, uh, it's larger and larger, and a lot of us are going to hand a property down, and I would be happy for our daughter to pay the taxes or whatever. Uh, but a lot of people are opposed to that. I'm wondering if there's any financial analysis that's been done of the cost if everybody here could hand their properties down for another generation without paying any additional property tax. Thank you. Well, Prop 19, uh, the Paula, two Paula, if you yeah. don't mind, we're going to take... I think we should take all questions all at one time and then you can respond oh. once. We just want to make sure it's not a discussion and that we have the okay. public comment um, forum. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So we've got the Prop 19 question. Um, and then uh, Karen Batra. Hi. Um, thank you for the um, excellent presentation. I have just a two couple of comments. They're, not, they're kind of forward looking. Um, I'm not sure they're quite questions. One is um, currently the um, housing market slowed down a lot because the inability to obtain insurance. It's not the California Fair Plan or the not admitted market. And I was wondering, like, how do we plan for that? And then the second thing is also with new construction right now, uh, unfortunately, the planning department is very understaffed. And I know of a resident who has passed ACC and hasn't quite been able to start building. And how do we plan for both of those items for the next coming years? Thank you. Okay, Garen, so that's on insurance and new construction. And then um, I see Catherine gone. Is that how you say her name? Yes, yes, it is. Thank you very much. That was an, Paula, thank you so much for that excellent, but mind spinning <laughs> presentation. <laughs> but I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this, but Paul, you were talking earlier about cities budgeted differently and assuming different percentages of VLF. Do we know what Portola Valley has been using for the past few years in its uh, budget, in its budget creation? Thank you. Okay, and that question's on VLF percentage we use in budgeting. And um, the next, I see a question, it's just a phone number. So um, please identify, it ends in 7562. Please tell us who you are and ask your question. Good afternoon, this is Caroline Britongen. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm not as optimistic as you sound that we might get some uh, income back, especially when we have the state with a 68. Now the governor has reduced it to 38 by cutting services, billion. Um, and then San Mateo County has a 61 million deficit. So. Uh, I'm more on the prudent side, so I would not count on anything. But like you said, if we get something, it will be a miracle. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Carolyn. Um, others in the room, out of the room? Um, yes, yeah, someone in the room here. Uh, can, can you go to the mic? Otherwise, people online won't be able to hear you. Thank you. Hi, thanks. I'm Maida Jones. Um, I have two rather small questions. One, Paula, why are we comparing Portola Valley to places like Menlo Park or other towns or cities, rather, that have industry and shops and so on? It seems to me that really the only valuable or viable comparisons would be with towns like Woodside or maybe, I guess, some others uh, further up the peninsula. And then um, I didn't know what all the initials are were, but I figured most of them out. Oh, and the other thing I was wondering, I suppose this is premature, whether any of our local uh, uh, wooey towns like Portola Valley have par parcel taxes uh, imposed, because I gather that sort of down the line what our town might be thinking about. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, and I see Rita's hand is up online. Rita? Thank you, uh, Paula, great presentation. Um, my question is, you know, it just seems to be, uh, you know, some money that's owed to us and the lack of our uh, finance, sending in finances to the state, to ourselves and not having audits for many years. I'm just wondering if that has hurt us and that's why we now need you to help us figure out what it is that we have not received or perhaps what the steps we need to do to receive monies. And, and so that's not necessarily for you, you're new on the scene, but um, perhaps some of the people that have been on the, uh, or, or the consultant, the other consultant that we have, um, uh, Heather Roden can answer that question. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. So I, I heard that as uh, have the being behind on audits hurt us in terms of funding. Um, I don't see anyone else, so I'll hand it back to Paula to respond <laughs> where she can. So it's all in the back of my piece of paper right here. So uh, Prop 19, uh, Prop 19, Prop 19 changed the way that a parent to child, grandparent to grandchild, or a person uh, transferring their base can happen. The parent to child, in order for the, the child to not have a large step up in the value, they have to live in the house. And so if the child does not live in the house, it's going to be revalued. And if they do live in the house, there's a million dollar step up. So the first million dollars uh, goes away. And if you're selling the house for $3 million or the house is valued at $3 million, uh, they're still going to get taxed on 2 million of that 3 million. So uh, Prop, 13, Prop 19 changed the landscape. There are people that are trying to change that back so that uh, the wealth that is, uh, made in a prior generation can be patched, uh, can be passed to a future generation. I don't know. Uh, that's the, the Jarvis group that's trying to get that, uh, that changed. So at the present time, uh, you have to live in the house in order to have that, uh, that basic step, uh, remain the same in terms of taxation. Uh, asked about, uh, insurance and new construction. No, I really haven't seen uh, a, a huge impact on sale prices or on sales at all uh, with the inability to get insurance. And I know that in some of the counties where there have been wildfires, uh, Santa Barbara County comes to mind, uh, Sonoma County comes to mind, uh, th there are some difficulties in, in getting insurance uh, for residences in those areas. I just haven't seen it uh, uh, translate into non-sales at all. Uh, Catherine, you asked about the uh, Portola Valley VLF percent. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that uh, you're uh, responding to Sharif saying that they're budgeting half of what they get. Uh, we pretty much go with that. You're getting a little more than half of right now and the prior a little more than half of the amount that you should get based on the growth that your city has seen year over year. And that's what usually is used for the VLF in lieu. Uh, I, there has been legislation in the past to try to refund some of this money. It's never made you whole. So there is sort of a precedent to do this. And I think that the first time they did it was in 2021 and it went back three years, but it wasn't a, a full true up. So at, at this point, um, you know, I'm fine with budgeting half of what you normally would receive. Uh, we really don't know the number until the end of June when the Department of Education at the state level works with the County of San Mateo to tell you exactly what you should have received. And if you received more than that, you will have that, that excess uh, taken away from your first payment the next year. Uh, Karen, you asked about the state, uh, not trusting the state and the state might come and, and uh, not provide the revenue. The interesting thing about the state of California being able to uh, capture uh, your property tax revenue, back when Arnold Schwarzenegger was voted in, the first thing he did because the, the state couldn't balance his budget was to, to put the economic recovery bonds 
on the ballot. And those bonds were approved. And then the state legislators had to find a way to pay for that. And what they did was they took a quarter of the state sales tax that cities and the counties received, and they took uh, revenue that was going to ERAF to help pay that back. And at that time, they did the VLF swap. And there was such a cry from the local agencies that Prop 1A was adopted. And what Prop 1A does is it prohibits the state from taking money from local governments without paying it back and without paying it back in 10 years and not pay, not re, not being able to do it again until it's paid back. And the state has not borrowed any money, knock wood, since that, that uh, 2004 or five through about 2000, it was about eight years. So almost 2010, 11, uh, before they paid back all the money that was owed in the triple flip and the VLF swap, which were a property tax and and uh, ERAF and sales tax uh, shifts. Uh, asking why we include uh, with, uh, Portola Valley, uh, the reports that we provide to our clients are, are reports that are used on a countywide basis. Some of our clients wanna see other, other jurisdictions and we can do that as well. Uh, focusing, I think we give you the information that you can focus what you want to, you can select the cities you want to select. You can select Woodside, you can select Hillsborough, you can select any of the cities, or if you chose to look at cities in Santa Clara or Santa Cruz counties, we could provide those for you. You wanted to look at those that were more uh, ocean facing and more residential oriented rather than being cities with commercial and industrial uh, great, great numbers of commercial industrial properties. So you know, we have the ability to do more than what I showed you today, but unless a city asks for it, we provide them with what's happening in their county so they can compare themselves to other cities that they want to compare themselves to within a county. Uh, local parcel taxes, other towns, yes. Uh, you know, most of those parcel taxes are very focused. A paramedic tax, uh, a, a tax for certain kinds of improvements. Those are an easier sell than a general uh, property tax increase that isn't specifically designated. And uh, if you're going to try to sell that, you're going to have to do a lot of work to make sure that a parcel tax is something that resonates with the electors. And for you, you have, I, I'm not gonna say mostly, uh, homes that are owned by the people that are living in them, but you may have fewer absentee owned properties in your community than some others may. And so those are the real voters. If you have a, a lot of commercial and industrial, often the people that own the commercial and industrial sites don't live in town and they don't get to vote So uh, on, on your measures. So uh, it, it might be a little more of an uphill battle uh, to have a parcel tax be approved. And I know we don't do the kind of audit that you are referring to. I think Rita, you asked this question. Um, the auditor or the controller of San Mateo is audited by the State Department of Finance controller. And they are audited on a rolling, I believe it is a 10 year basis. And so we get the audits that are performed by those auditors. We look through those to make sure that there isn't something that really sticks out that we would go to a city and say, hey, look at, you know, as happened back in, 19, in 2005 when the auditor in, or the controller in this county didn't want to implement the TEA, didn't like it, didn't do it, and they got caught. And so that, that kind of uh, a thing took a while to, to litigate, but once it was litigated, you lost, I don't know, maybe seven years of the allocation you could have had. You got the last four years uh, after it was approved. I think that answers your questions. Anybody? Great. Um, thank thank right. you very much. Uh, Paul, I just want to express my thanks for your report. I've been on this committee for 29 years, and that's the first in-depth description of how property taxes work that I've ever heard. So I really don't know how we got along without it. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Paula, and for the committee and for the community. This is the first time you're hearing of it for a very long time. First time we're getting in-depth reports. We'll make sure that this is posted. It's on our website. I promise you this is one of many conversations moving forward. Every budget conversation, every mid-year, every time we talk about something, we will talk about property tax. We will have the analysis behind it. Um, I have contracted, we have contracted with Paula and HDL, Corn Cone. So this will be the new norm, if you will. So um, there is a learning curve for us and for the community and all of us, but we'll get there. And so my commitment is that you'll see this on a regular basis uh, moving forward. So to be continued, if you will. And I just want to thank Paula for all your work and your help. We've met many times behind the scenes. Um, she uh, prepared this specifically for us, as you know, and then um, we will be able to get these reports on a regular basis. And this is what I'm accustomed to. This is what we need as a, a town. And so we'll continue with that. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Good evening. And and now I'll I'll hand it back to Sharif to introduce uh, Heather Roden at uh, Christian Company. Thank you, George. So based on that and based on the conversations we've had about where we're at, the first was the property tax, the trends, and to put a pin in the conversation, if you will, it's the, we must take note of the decrease in the growth, which is not a big deal. That ebbs and flows every year. It just happens to be a big deal when it's, you know, everything kind of comes together, but property tax will always ebb and flow. You always have a, uh, an increase or a decrease in that growth, if you will. The good thing for the town of Portola Valley and many other cities in San Mateo is that you always are almost talking about a growth all the time. So whether it's a 1% growth, a 5% growth, property tax always grows. In other towns in the East Bay, in Southern California and other places, you can imagine what the um, pandemic or what the Great Recession would do. They were actually in 20% decreases, 30% decreases. We might have a 6% growth one year and might go down to 1%, like you saw, or minus one. So that's the, the, the piece of that. The second piece is then that VLF shortfall is something that we do need to talk about and we'll talk about moving forward. So with that, the second piece of this three-pronged approach, if you will, presentations for today is hearing from Christian Company themselves. As you know, we um, contracted with Christian Company for about a six-month stint. That six-month stint is coming to its tail end in the next month or two. One of the things that I promise is that I probably will come back asking for more time with Christian Company. So you'll see this update, but this is an important piece for the committee and for the town to see the progress report of where we're at and where we're going. So I wanted to invite Heather directly. Um, Heather Roden is our, um, she's an advisory manager for Christian Company. She's also a former finance director. So not only does she know the work, she did the work and she is basically um, the in-house expert for us holding our hand as we go through um, these different pieces. So thank you, Heather, for your time today. Of course. Uh, yes, as Sharif said, I work with Christian Company and we came in and did a review of the Portola Valley Finance Department and kind of said, you know, what things are going smoothly, what things need some work. Um, and I am here to give you an update on that. So I will share my screen and hope that this works the way that I want it to. Okay. Do you see this full screen now? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So I am giving an update on everything that we've done so far. So I'm going to look at, you know, kind of the timeline of what we all put together, what we've done so far, the changes that have been implemented. And then if you remember the memo that we put out, there were um, four different categories. And I kind of touch on the ones where we said, you know, improvement was needed um, and, you know, where we are, where we've come, have we, they been addressed, are we still addressing them, things like that. And then what we plan on doing soon, uh, the upcoming tasks, and then I will see if you guys have questions. So I came in in September of 2023 and did that review that I mentioned before. And uh, I went back and forth with staff for a little while trying to understand, you know, what certain processes were. And so in November of 2023, we released, uh, the town manager released the results of that report, and we started working to help clean some stuff up. 
Um, in January, we begin working in earnest um, with getting, you know, fiscal year 2021 wrapped up so that we could uh, start the audit. And now we're in March of 2024, and we are in the middle of the 2021 audit, the auditors were actually on site with staff last week, and we're working back and forth with them to finalize that for you. So we've worked on the audit. We've worked on some policies and procedures. Uh, we've done staff training, and we've worked on some of those fiscal health items. We've been able to cross some off the list. So what's been implemented so far? Um, we have best practices. We've started implementing best practices in cash receipts, in the closings of um, the fiscal years. We're working on checklists and all of those fun things. Um, and asset tracking, I check in with staff on a regular basis and see, you know, any items that we note as we go through the audit for 21 and we're saying, you know, where this was an issue, how are we addressing it now? We're putting those in place now so that we don't wait. Um, policies and procedures. I know that staff have been working on procedures for different tasks and um, Chris has started work on larger overarching policies. Uh, and again, the fiscal year 21 audit is underway. Now I will note that this will be a running theme in this presentation of best practices, policies and procedures and audit. Um, it is mentioned quite often. So the fiscal review update, that memo that went out broke category or broke different tasks down into four different categories, things that needed immediate attention, things that should be addressed within about three months. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, things that should be addressed over the next year and items that were up to date or should be reviewed at a later date. And I am not going to address that last category. This presentation, I'm going to go through the first three. That said, here's a bunch of words for you to look at. Um, so this is the start of the list of items that needed immediate attention. So cash handling procedures. Staff have started um, implementing this already. We are working on actually drafting procedures and a policy. We have a draft policy that um, came out today actually that we are working with staff to finalize. Um, but there have already been some items that were put in place including um, just uh, the deposit of funds at, you know, within 10 days of receipt, um, the, we implemented, we got a safe. So, you know, all of that is in, it has been done. Those things were addressed immediately. Bank reconciliations, fiscal year 21 is complete. Fiscal year 22 um, is being worked on. I think staff have gotten a much better handle on the items that need to be entered prior to the bank reconciliations being done. And that's gonna make the bank reconciliations a lot faster. System uh, reconciliations, we have reconciled the new system. I say new, it was implemented in, uh, 2020. Um, the beginning balances have been reconciled, so that is good. Um, and that has to do partly with the software implementation, but staff have gotten procedures or they've gotten the process down for reconciling imports from other systems. So for example, the permitting software or your business license software, those all feed into the current accounting system. And um, we now have processes in place to make sure that those are feeding in accurately and staff are reconciling those in a timely manner. Heather, we lost your sound for a second there. Here we go. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, now we can hear you. So the cat that has been ignoring me the entire time I've been sitting here waiting decided as soon as I started the presentation that he needed to be right on top of me. I apologize. <laughs> um, That's great. <laughs> so the, uh, which, what, what did you hear? <laughs> Sharif, what was the last thing that you guys heard? And I can go over it again. I think you were talking about system reconciliations. Okay. All right. So we've, like I said, we've completed the reconciliation. Oh, no, that's what I was talking about. Uh, so staff are currently doing t more timely reconciliation of information that is fed it from other systems into the accounting system. So that is good. Um, the software implementation, as we're going through, we're working on some of the issues that um, it, the software was implemented in 2020, like I said, it's had a lot of changes over the last few years that the town didn't act, didn't get a chance to implement. Um, and those are some of the things that we're going to be working on um, is making sure it, it both accuracy, but efficiency. Uh, we want to make sure we get those implemented. Payroll journal information. The staff is up to date on this. We want to make sure we get actual like written procedures down, but we are up to date. Um, so that was really exciting so that we can get budget, um, uh, budget reports out. Benefit reconciliations. We have done a complete reconciliation of the 457 plan for the last few years. That one is done. Uh, we have not done formal reviews of some of the other benefits, but I know that the bills are currently being reviewed by the assistant town manager. The it, to make sure that you know people are going off as needed or being put on the bills where needed. Um, Payroll changes entry. This has been addressed. There's been a change in who processes payroll and who enters changes. So you have that best practice in place now. So that's amazing. Um, we have our annual audit reports. Like I said, the fiscal year 21 audit is underway. That is exciting. Um, we are working on some of the sampling that the auditors have requested, and we're actually working on gathering all the information for the fiscal year 22 and 23 audits as we do the 21 audit. So when we start those with the auditor, those should happen really quickly after. Um, the state controller's office reports, I think earlier somebody mentioned that, you know, we hadn't filed some reports and so some money was being withheld. Um, we are actually in the process of the 2022 report has been drafted. There's a couple of reclassifications that need to happen for fiscal year 23 before that report can be finalized, but we are really close to um, completing those and getting them submitted, and then the funds will be made available to the town. I did confirm with the state controller's office that as soon as the reports are filed, you will get any back funds that were withheld, so that was good. Um, the treasurer's report to council, this is something that we need to work on. We have not gotten to this item yet. Budget to actual reports, work on these is underway. We got the fiscal year 24 budget loaded into the accounting system. Now that um, current entries are being done in a timely manner, we should be able to get these reports going soon. SB 1186 fee reporting. Um, this is a fee that is collected on business licenses. And um, the, uh, there was an issue before where it was being recorded incorrectly and that has been identified and changed going forward. And we've identified all the past amounts. So that's good. Compliance with current auditing or accounting standards. This is something that um, we're working as we go through the audit and we find different things uh, that we need to address. We're addressing them as, as they come up. So the next were the items that said should be addressed in the next three months. Check run procedures. Um, staff have implemented some efficiencies in this, but uh, we still need to actually draft procedures and the software module should be implemented. Um, the appropriations limit, 
we did this. Uh, the, the, this was completed and uh, Sharif, has this gone to council yet? Or I know we were talking, it has, perfect. Yep. So we were able to increase the appropriations limit. Asset management, town staff are working um, to, they've done the fiscal year 21 schedule and they're working to get 22 and 23 up. I know that they are currently flagging um, anything that might be considered a fixed asset as it comes through the check run. So that is good for new, for current or new assets. Um, contracting procedures, this isn't something that Chris has really gotten into, um, but I know that I don't think the town has implemented the contract, uh, the contract management software yet. Um, journal entries, we are um, mostly up to date on these. I think we're we're much better off than we were, so that's awesome. We do need to implement a actual uh more formal procedure for this but they are up to date general ledger we're working on a year-end close checklist um and that will also help with a monthly close checklist to do a soft close to make sure we stay on top of this um timesheet procedures no changes have been made so this is something that for um should, should be looked at at some point. Grant tracking, again, we haven't gotten to that yet. And then items that should be addressed in the next year. Uh, I don't think we have touched most of this. I know we're working on policies and procedures. Um, and then it's just, we, we haven't, yeah. All of this is still on the list of things to do but none of this was like an immediate concern when I reviewed it. So upcoming tasks, again, like I said, policies and procedures gonna be reoccurring theme. My job is very exciting. Um, so policies and procedures, we're reviewing the town's fiscal policies currently. Like I said, we had a draft of the cash, um, the accounts receivable procedure come out today. So we're working with staff on that. The fiscal year 22 and 23 audits will be uh, going as soon as the 21 audit is complete. So that's coming up. Budget and Treasury, we are going to be working on making sure that budget reports and the Treasury report are presented timely um, as soon as possible. And with that, I will turn it back to you guys. Thank you very much. Um... That was very helpful detail. I'd like to open uh, it to the panel first for questions of Heather. George, if I may just um, add a couple of things for Heather before. Oh questions. yeah, please. Yeah. Um, as we talked about deliverables and timelines and coming back to you with where we're at and based on what Heather mentioned as well. So we are in, in the middle of our fiscal year 21 audit. The auditors are literally here either on site or you know online reviewing fiscal year 21. The goal is then to have a draft um, financial statement and audit in the month of April, which we will then approve. So basically the fiscal year 21 audit will be complete in April with the reports to that. Because the fiscal year 21 takes so long to review and get us up to speed and re-enter some of the journals and, and reconciliations and things, fiscal year 22 and 23 will be much faster. So the intent is then to start fiscal year 22 as fast as we can as staff and the auditor has time on their calendar within the next couple months to get that going. So then we would have another audit under our belt and complete, call it summertime, if you will. Um, then the fiscal year 23 audit would be actually even faster because they're doing the, the pieces for that moving forward. And so that goal would be by the end of the year, beginning of next calendar year, that would be done as well. So fiscal year 21 now, fiscal year 22 around the middle of the year, fiscal year 23 towards the end of the year. And it's all based on calendaring, based on time of the auditors, and also the fact that we're recruiting for our director of finance and that'll help um, facilitate that as we move forward. So I just wanted to give a statement about that. And then Heather also mentioned, as, as Chris does their deep dive with staff and we're reconciling and fixing and 
um, removing things and having things. We're not only, you know, fishing, they're teaching us to fish, right? And so this is where Heather has been instrumental in pausing and saying, you need a procedure for this. You need a policy for this. Because my biggest concern and biggest um, directive was, how do we not repeat this? How do we not get in this situation again? That's making sure that we have the policy in place, the new procedure, the new piece, so that this doesn't become a recurring thing. We're just, we're fixing it and we're moving on. Thank you. That was really helpful. And the audit timing was one of my questions. So I appreciate that. And um, uh, questions from others on the panel. Hey, Heather, this is Bill Urban. A uh, question for you, uh, an opinion. Um, uh, a basic monthly financial report for the town, for example, showing uh, beginning of month cash and investment balances, any receipts during the month, any disbursements during the month, and then an ending balance across all the town's accounts. Do you, do you think the town is capable today of, issue, of starting to issue a monthly report of that type? So I think that we could put together a basically, that's basically the treasury report. I think putting it in context of while you know, you have this much cash, how much of it is spendable? What is it spendable on? I, I don't think we're there yet, um, but I think we will be soon. But it, it, to follow up, you, are you saying that you think the town is capable of at least showing what the cash flows are, what the beginning balances, ending balances, money coming in, money going out, those those four numbers every month? Um, we could put together what's in the bank and investments. Yes, I think money going in and money going out is easy. That is already in the accounting system. Money going in involves reconciliation between outs, outside software, like I mentioned before, the permitting software and the um, the um, business license software. And I think there's another one, maybe recreation. Um, so those reconciliations are becoming more timely, but the reconciliations are not perfect yet. Um, so we could get a, we could put together, you know, what actually went into the bank account. But if we're looking at, you know, when did checks come in, like in an actual um, cash basis, um, well, no, sorry, accrual basis, it wouldn't be perfect, but we could easily say, you know, look at the statements and say, this is what went in and this is what went out, not necessarily what was due during that month. And Bill, that's the ultimate goal is to have a month end close, if you will, month end reconciliation. And so at the end of all this, we're going to have month end closes where by the 10th business day, as an example, so it's usually about the 15th of the month, you're going to reconcile and close out the month before, right? That hasn't happened for many, many months, if not a year or so. So the ultimate goal is you, you, you reconcile your month after the 10th business day, you get those reports. Um, anyone can certainly ask for a monthly report. A monthly report might not help in the big context. You actually want a quarterly report because there's so many ways we get paid in the rears and so many delays in the different pieces. I, as a finance director, as a town manager, I don't look at monthly reports. I look at quarterly reports because your sales tax is only going to come in a certain area. Your your property taxes and other come in a different area. So we can certainly prepare monthly reports. There might not be as much value, but to your question going back, it's really the reconciliation of the month that's key in that the finance staff internally at the 10th of the month know that they need to reconcile the month before and all that information is available. If you were to ask for that now today, Bill, or if I was to ask for that as town manager or council, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And that's the ultimate goal. Thanks. Hi, um, this is Steve Kasani. Um, now that you've been on the ground for a few months and, and have seen uh, kind of how things are working, just curious, are you finding things to be generally consistent with what you expected? Better? Worse? Any surprises? Um, it It's consistent. I think that the staff are definitely getting their feet under the, because there were some newer staff that had just started when I did this report and they're definitely getting their feet under them. And they have been a huge help in, you know, making sure that some of these things are implemented, that a lot of this is 
can be done in a timely manner. Um, Cindy's just one person. So uh, it, it takes a whole team to do the finances for the city. And so that has been much better than it could have been because those uh, staff are really getting their feet under them. Thanks. Um, do you happen to know offhand how what the magnitude is of the SCO funds that are being withheld that we're hoping to get soon? Sharif, is it about? I can answer. That's about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so that's helpful. And they're restricted for for certain purposes. It's for roads. It's not roads, general yeah. fund. Yeah, road it's for our roads. Okay, yeah, road maintenance. Mm -hmm. And Thank Heather you. did confirm that we once we turn those reports and we will get that money. That was the key. Thank you. Um, other comments from committee members? Yeah, it's Michelle Take. Um, so in your opinion, um, is there enough staff? I guess we're missing the director. I guess, and you're in theory functioning at, at that level or at, for that position, but do you feel we're fully fully staffed now? Once the director comes on, I definitely think that you guys are in a really good position. Um, I think uh, the director will want to review each person's tasks and make sure that everyone is functioning um, efficiently. And there's, you know, those checks and balances in place per, you know, best practice. But I, I think that the number of staff that you have is sufficient at this point. And Michelle, to your point as well, um, so we have Heather helping us, obviously, as Christian company. I've dedicated probably 10, 20% of my time as director of finance, if you will. And then obviously have Cindy for the continuity piece as admin services manager helping. And so Cindy's, you know, knee deep in the audit and the reconciliations and the different pieces. She's really one doing the day-to-day -day where Heather and I kind of wear that director of finance hat. And so once we have a full-time finance director, um, that'll make a big difference. And to that segue, we are um, literally starting interviews next week for our director of finance pool. And so that usually takes a um, couple of weeks, but our goal, and we have a, um, what we feel is a, a good pool of candidates. Our goal would be by in the month of April that we would have a director of finance in place and or announced, if you will. So this no longer just a kind of a pipe dream out there. <laughs> We're making that happen too. That's great. That's very encouraging. Thank you. Other comments from committee members? If, if not, I'd like to go to the public and we'll, we'll try to do this the same way we did last time where we'll take all the comments and questions and ask Heather to just try to keep track of them and then respond at the end. Um, I see that Dale Fow has his, oh wait, Craig Taylor here in the room. We'll go with Craig first. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that we're gonna get fiscal 2023 done by the end of the year, hopefully. Um, or the beginning of next year. Or beginning of next Thank year. You. Um, so my, but my question then is when does 2024 get done? And then following up on that, what's reasonable to expect after a close? Like when, when should audits get done? And I can take it as an answer when we're all done. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. And um, we'll take note of that question. And then uh, Dale Fow, I see you have your hand up online. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for the presentations today. My question is, is about our current uh, situation. And I understand that uh, we're way behind. But uh, at this point, do we have any indication of how far off from our budget, uh, our actual spending is? Uh, I think that would be pretty useful to some of us here in the community. Thank you. Okay, great. A question about our actual spend um, and how that tracks to our budget. Um, someone in the room? Yes, please come on up. So it's Greg Franklin. Um, Maida Jones had to leave, but um, her question was, could... Um, Cushion Company make a recommendation for the role of the Finance Committee in overseeing Portola Valley's finances and on what regularity, what basis might that be? 
So that's her question. My question really is more specifically about variance analysis uh, for the budget. I think we, uh, the town approved budget, I think was um, uh, $10.1 million of revenue and $11.3 or $4 million worth of expenses. So we budgeted a $1.3 million deficit for this fiscal year. So exactly when uh, will uh, we be in a position to know exactly where we are on a variance analysis basis. In other words, when could we have, you know, when could you have like six months year to date, seven months year to date, you know, like what, 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 what's a reasonable expectation for the variance analysis uh, historically and then going forward? Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, anyone else online or in the room who wants to say something before we hand it off? Rita, I see your hand is up. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. It's, um, you know, it's unfortunate that we didn't have this presentation a few years ago, but uh, this is where we are and, uh, you know, trying to move forward. And so I'd like to know how many contractors are now, you know, before there were several contractors in the finance department. And, uh, you know, sometimes they'd show up to these meetings and sometimes they didn't. And it was always unclear what their responsibilities were. And when asked, it would be, you know, we'd hear about it the next time and never actually um, heard about it. And it's good to hear that the software is actually being utilized. And I'm wondering if the, um, you know, the different things like say our attorney uh, works on lots of different projects. Are those projects now coded? Uh, we were told before, oh, if you wanna see those things, go look at the software. And of course the software was not updated properly, so you couldn't see any kind of breakdown. It was just everything was in one gigantic lump. And uh, you know, you mentioned Heather about um, you know some software to look at contracts. And I'm wondering if part of your uh, plan, and and I hope that the town is putting money towards this, is to audit our current contracts. Uh, several of them look like they need to be uh, amended or looked at or or are certain things question and update it. So I, I really hope because that is money, you know, if you look at the warrant list, that is money that is spilling out of here every month. And for a town that has no money, you know, the uh, previous speaker, Paula, who was absolutely wonderful and we need that information, you know, it seems that there's already a contract that had been signed for her. And then for um, Wednesday night, there are two contractors with two contracts with the uh, auditors that have already been signed and somehow are being approved on Wednesday night. So I really hope that we can get a handle of that so that we can you know, watch our money moving forward instead of catching up. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, anyone else? Okay, seeing, seeing no one, I'll, I'll hand it to Sharif and Heather to respond. Yeah, George, if you don't mind, I'll respond, I think, to most of them since they're Portola Valley specific. And Heather, feel free to chime in. I see you nodding there. Um, some of the questions, that the first question of when is the ACFR due, the financial report at the end of every fiscal year? It's due to the state December 31st. So it's within six months after your year-end close. That's the due date. Um, most jurisdictions turn them in late November, beginning of December. If not, they, the new kind of... Um, piece for cities because it's been more complicated as many cities turn it in in January as well. You can ask for a 30 day extension. So it's really December, January is when they're due um, moving forward. So it's not something you're gonna close out the month in July and turn in in August, that doesn't happen. The year end close um, takes about three months to reconcile July and the last month. So you start preparing in August, September, you get your audit um, in, you have your draft reports. So basically the month of December is the target. Um, for your um, act for your comprehensive financial report. Yeah, and the, like just to add to that, this kind of ties back to those treasury reports of, you know, you know, we take 15 days in theory to wrap it up and so the state doesn't tell you what was due to you in July until August or September sometimes and that's why it takes so long to close the year is because you don't get report or you don't get the funds for, you know, what really should have been yours that fiscal year until a few months later. 
Thank you, Heather. And then the, regarding revenue and expenses, we obviously in the future will get our revenue expenses on a timely basis. I've committed to doing a mid-year report to where you get the revenue and expenses, committed also doing a quarterly review for that, um, especially the mid-year and the third quarter are the heaviest where you really want to get your information after your property tax and sales tax have come in. We do have preliminary numbers and I'm going to share that. That's the third leg of this, if you will, um, where I'll lay out how we're going to share this information uh, moving forward. The finance committee question about um, how often, Heather, you're more than welcome to answer. Um, and all the finance committees and that I've been involved with for many, many years, they are ad hoc and they meet at certain times of the year depending, but there are so certain cadences that folks meet, um, right, Heather, where, whether it's you know for a year and close or to review the, the act for budget season to discuss like CIP projects, those kind of things. So there's a definitely, there's a cadence to it, but it still becomes you know ad hoc to a certain degree. So Heather, anything to add on that? No, I agree. It, you know, at most quarterly plus when certain reports come out, it's not, um, I wouldn't say you need to meet monthly for any reason, anything like that. Thank you. And then regarding um, contractors, we do have preliminary information. We're going to share that just in generalities today, but that's coming to a meeting soon, talking about our contract fees, our legal fees, all those different pieces. That's key. And then um, a lot of discussion regarding auditing of our contractor contracts themselves. That is for internal staff that uh, will be using it. There's an audit piece to that. That's not something that Christian Company is going to be enlisted to do the help of. The auditors review the contracts for the actual integrity of the contract, the payment, the uh, other pieces. But we also are going to be conducting a review of just all the contracts we have in general and what we're spending them on. Because also, as we Right now, we're a skeleton crew relying on contractors to do a lot of the work. Once we get our full complement of staff, then you would expect and or direct that the contract contractor work outside would be spent less. And that's the, the next step. Great, thank you. Um, any other comments from the staff on this before we move on? Okay, uh, seeing nothing, we'll move on to item C, which is our financial status and sustainability. Thank you so much, Heather. I am going to share my screen. So as your town manager and as your, you know, call it dotted line or 10%, 20% finance director. One of the things that I wanted to make sure that we talk about is the bigger picture and what we really need to be focusing on. Obviously, we need to get caught up. We need to have our audits in place in order to receive grants, apply for grants. We need to have our, our year end close. We need to have proper financial reports, our investment reports, all those different pieces. But what I really wanted to do is take an even bigger step. And what I did last week was I literally invited every council member one-on-one, um, -on -one, and I had a whiteboard on my wall in the office. And I had this, this is my whiteboard, basically in PowerPoint form, really putting my thoughts to paper as, as your town manager, what's my role, what's my responsibility, especially on the fiscal side. And so we have our re reset, refocus, restructure, the purple box. That's where we are now. We've reset, we've refocused, we're restructuring, we're having, we're putting staff in the right place, the right people in the right spot. And like I talked about, that's, that's not always easy, moving folks around, we'll have new folks, we'll have some folks that won't be here any longer, all that takes time, but there, there's an end point to that. And that restructure, if we will, will take the next couple months and we'll be done. I've been here for seven months, there's been a lot of change, a lot of turnover. At some point, obviously that change needs to stop. And my intent is that the restructure portion of this will be finished by the end of this fiscal year. So we have about three more months of that. That restructure ties into budget timing where I'll present the town manager's budget recommended to council based on the restructure. Here are our people, here's our structure, here's what we're doing, and here's the changes that we made. And so when we look at the future of Portola Valley, one of the things that I wanna make sure that we don't lose focus on and that we focus on as a group and enlisting finance committee's help to get there is we need a sustainable financial model for the town. Right now, our model is not working. Right now, our model is relying on our reserves and we can't do that. And that's reflected here in this whiteboard, if you will, is that in the next two or three years, we need to make sure that Portola Valley is fiscally sustainable, fiscally viable. Um, I originally called this um, 
Portola Valley sustainability, but that got confused with our sustainability efforts. So I'm using the words here of um, a financially um, viable model, if you will. So if you recall, when I first came on board as your town manager, there was discussion about having a partial tax, having some sort of partial tax to increase the revenue for the town to get us to our models would be more sustainable, if you will. One of the things that I requested from town council and they obviously approved was that we're not there yet. We're not ready to have a parcel tax. We need to get our fiscal house in order in order to ask the community for X amount of dollars. And so what we're doing now is obviously when we get our audits in, when we get our financial reports and get the different pieces, we can then go back to the community with confidence and you can ask for funds, ask for money to fund a certain degree for the town. So what I wanted to lay out here, and this is a very simple diagram, but I wanted to make it simple on purpose today is I'm laying the groundwork, if you will, for an April 24th study session with council. And so what I've asked for from town council is to have a study session, an hour and a half from 5.30 to 7 p.m. on April 24th that focuses just on this, just on our finances, as opposed to having just a presentation within the council meeting. So the first kind of announcement, if you will, is stay tuned, mark your calendar for April 24th, where we'll talk about this in depth. But today's laying the groundwork and just getting this, the finance committee's thoughts on this and also um, enlisting your help and direction. So you have the three fiscal years laid out. You have fiscal year 2023, which is the year we're in now. You have fiscal year 2024 and you have fiscal year 25, 26. If you were to normally do your um, parcel tax, that would have been in calendar year of 24. It would have been in fiscal year 25, only what, six months from now. We weren't ready for that. Obviously, the election has the, the regular cycle, and the next regular election cycle would have been calendar year 26, November of 26, which is for the Senate race, I believe. Um, that election is too late in the game for us to be able to talk about a partial tax. Because if you were to have a partial tax or any sort of special, I mean, any sort of election on November of 26, it takes about a year for those funds to kick in. And we don't have that luxury, if you will. So what I laid out here is just very simply where we are as a town and that we're doing our reset, refocus, restructure. You have the very simple, I know this is a crude, you know, this is just a whiteboard piece. This will be backed up with numbers. Is that you have your revenue line, which is the green line going down. You have your expense line, obviously going up. And at some point, those two lines cross. Your typical revenue versus expenses slide, if you will, and we'll add numbers to that. At some point, not only do they cross, but your expense line is gonna exceed your revenue line, especially if you don't have reserves. This fiscal year that we're in right now, we have a $450,000 increase for our sheriff's contract. The original increase was $850,000, as you all know, and you've talked about many times. The sheriff's office, the sheriff herself, offered a discount of half of that increase to mitigate that increase of $450,000. So the real cost to the town is $450,000 for this year. We also have our increased legal fees and our increased consulting fees. And I'll be presenting the actual numbers of those on April 24th. And so we have our legal fees, which is uh, a lot of it is based around our housing element. A lot of it is based around some of the other legal challenges that we've had. And so you would expect that to be a spike and that wouldn't be, you know, what we'd have on any given year, but I'll present those numbers to you. But we are over budget in our legal fees for this fiscal year. We then have our consulting fees. And obviously with the housing element, with the other pieces being down staff, our building and planning department has um, multiple needs for consulting. We are also spending money in consulting that you would expect would drop at some point or come down to a, a certain point. So we have we know we have this $450,000 um, sheriff's increase. We know we have an increase in legal fees and we have an increase in consulting fees. And we said for the first time that we're gonna use reserves and that was in the approved budget of $1.3 million. Obviously as a town, if you have a $3 million reserve and if your running rate is at $1.3 million, you have a three-year calendar, right? You have a three-year um, countdown of when you're going to run out of reserves, if you will. So we obviously don't want to get to that point, can't get to that point moving forward because you have to make a change. And many of these um, expenses for this year, I don't expect to repeat for next year. So the running rate shouldn't be necessarily 1.3 million. What's, what's, at, um, what's the challenge for us now is that when you get into fiscal year 24, 25, is you have at the very minimum this VLF shortfall of $301,000, and I've noted it here just in a bubble so you can see it. That doesn't necessarily take into account the decrease in the growth because we don't always 
um, budget to that growth anyways. But there's going to be some decrease in there of another $100,000 or so for the decrease in your property tax. And that decrease in property tax every year is going to change. Some years you're actually going to get more, some you're going to get less. But the VLF is really the headline, that VLF shortfall. If the county of San Mateo has their, I believe, $70 million shortfall and the state does not reimburse the county, that affects us. That's a $300,000 mark. The next piece was the sheriff's contract in which we were due to pay the $852,000 in full, right? Um, I did announce at the last meeting the town manager uh, message very quickly in that um, Corey and I, assistant town manager, we actually met with the um, county of San Mateo, sat down with the chief financial officer and sat down with the county manager's office and explained to them exactly where our situation was with the finances. I shared, I shared with them the Chris report and all the different pieces. And so the great news is that the um, county manager is willing now to offer us a 50% discount, if you will, for next year. So basically the county of San Mateo will absorb $450,000 in the increase in sheriff's fees. We will absorb only $450,000, right? So they're helping us for another year. My request was to help us over three years. So we have the $450,000 from the sheriff's office, the budget themselves, the county manager's budget absorbs $450,000 for next year, so we don't have to have the entire $850,000. I then requested a $225,000 um, discount, if you will, in year three, which is year 25, 26, and the county manager agreed. So we were able to um, receive $750,000, $800,000 in discounts, if you will, to smooth it, to make sure that we were able to pay the bill in full, basically, when it becomes full in 26, 27. So that's the good news, if you will is that the, the impact of the sheriff's contract is not going to hit us tomorrow in full. We have a year and a half, two years to get there. And that was on purpose, on design, asked by us to the county to help us because the commitment from us is that we're going to pay the increase in full, which is probably going to be a million dollars when it reaches that point after um, increases and costs and the different pieces. But that gives us time to have that special election, right, on purpose. And so... With those increases, we then have these question marks down at the bottom of, okay, what are our legal fees going to be next year? What are our consulting fees going to be next year? Is it going to be less than this year? Should, now that we have a housing element that's passed, our consulting fees, what is that going to look like? And doing a deep dive in what we spend, um, especially in our building and planning departments for our consulting, and making sure we understand that number, because those numbers are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars when you are, are over in those, those areas. So as town manager, as staff, and town council, we really need to take a look at the legal and the consulting fees moving forward. So we have reserves now that are going to pay for 24, 25, and then we get into, I mean, 20, yeah, 25, and then we get into 25, 26, where we still don't have a VLF. You still have now a bigger sheriff's contract increase of $675,000, and you have your structural deficit that's moving you forward. So what I've put here and what I've discussed with um, council is really starting the conversation of in order for us to be a fiscally viable town we have to make a change we have to get a handle on our expenses get a handle on our model but also introduce new revenue as a town and some of these things i know you've discussed before but obviously one of the pieces would be to look at being a charter town we are a general government um, council a charter town back in the day was very appealing for cities and towns because it gave you local control for taxation, for increase in revenue, and all the different pieces. Over time, the state has dwindled away the ability for towns and councils to govern themselves or to increase revenue in different pieces. What this really boils down to is that if we were to become a charter town, we would be able to um, we would be able to implement what's called a documentary transfer tax. The documentary transfer tax is when one house obviously moves from one owner to another, and that. Uh, that fee is set, if you will. I believe it's 5%. Don't quote me on that. But there's a set percentage in there. We as the town of Los Altos can't increase that because we're not a charter town. Redwood City, Los Altos, Los Angeles, San Mateo, whatever the other towns are that are charter towns, they can say, and the council can vote with then voter approval to say, we want to be a charter town. We want to increase the document transfer tax from 5% mil from to 7% or 9% and 10%. And this has been a an easier... Um, solution, if you will, when you have towns that are of more effluence to be able to do that, because when someone is purchasing a $3 million, $10 million, $15 million home, that documentary transfer tax is not 
a huge deal in the overall picture of closing out that ho that house. The issue now is because it takes such legal fees and filings and review and legalese to get to be a town. What I'm asking is that we at least do the review to see if the juice is worth the squeeze, if you will, because it may not be worth the one or $2 million. I heard the last quote from the last time you guys were reviewing this was about $2 million from start to finish. I don't know if spending $2 million to become a charter town to increase your document transfer tax by a couple hundred thousand or 50,000 per year might be worth it. So we at least have to do the review, see if it's worth the squeeze. Then there's obviously the conversation of having a parcel tax. We have about 1,800 parcels in the town of Portola Valley. Obviously, if you were to charge $500, you're looking at a $900,000 revenue stream moving forward. If you charge a $1,000 parcel tax, you're looking at a $1.8 million um, revenue stream. The, the tricky part with parcel taxes, as you all know, is it requires two-thirds majority vote. It takes time to implement. And then also, there's a certain sweet spot that you would have to do polling for and ask the town what the appetite is for a parcel tax. Um, in my general experience and what I've heard from the state and in my conferences and experiences, the sweet spot of the parcel taxes that get passed are about six and seven hundred dollars the parcel tax. So a thousand dollar parcel tax might be stretching it or might be a tall order, or it could definitely be possible depending on what we're putting into that parcel tax measure, if you will. A five hundred dollar parcel tax, they seem to pass relatively simply. You um, heard, hold that thought. Oh, really? Do they meet here? Oh, my gosh. Sure. Okay. Didn't know that. Thank you. So I will be very quick. <laughs> so the parcel tax is something you definitely want to take a look at. There's also thoughts and, and conversation of annexing. Annexing, right or wrong, good or bad, just at least needs to be analyzed. There's Los Trancos Woods. There's Ladera. There's other areas that is the juice worth the squeeze to annex? What's the benefit of the property tax or the sales tax that you might get from that? So each one of these, you might look at, cross it out and say, nope, as a town, we're not going to do that. Or yes, we're going to pursue that. And then the last piece is land sale. We have, I call them random pieces of land in Portola Valley that we own. We might consider selling a piece of land to get us uh, a, a healthier reserve or to buy us a year or two in cash flow or different pieces. I'm not saying any of these is a golden answer or a golden ticket, just something that needs to be reviewed. Um, obviously, if you don't do that, I put in gray here to put here, not as a scare tactic, not as anything, is that we could be unincorporated San Mateo County. We no longer be a town, right? And so this was my whiteboard. This is what I presented to council one-on-one. -on -one. I also um, presented this to them as a group. I'm going to be presenting this on April 24th to the community and to council um, with numbers attached to it. I'm basically setting the stage of where we want to go. But Part of the intent was, I don't think anyone can argue with the fact that we want to stay a town and we want to be fiscally viable and financially viable. And so this is the presentation that I will be making moving forward. What I also want to make clear and for the record, whether it's the newspaper or the community or when you guys leave, this doesn't scare me. This is not a scare tactic. This is not saying doom and gloom. Yes, there's a countdown of our reserves and different pieces, but all of these have solutions. Every city has some sort of structural deficit, has some sort of revenue loss, has some sort of mitigation piece. I've done this three times before in three different cities. So all this is solvable. So it's not the, you know, set the alarms, we're in deep trouble, all these different pieces. But the message I want to walk out with, and I'm asking for finance committee's help, is that we need to start now. We need to start now if we want to be a fiscally viable town in three years with these reviews of a charter, a parcel tax, a UUT, UUT increase, annexing, land sale, that needs to start now. And so let's focus on what we're doing in the next 30, 60, 90 days, really needing finance committee's help and leadership to explore these and also getting the, the town and town council, all of us on board on the same page to what do we do so that we have the, and what I coined was PV thrive. How do we thrive as a town as opposed to just surviving or getting by, if you will. So that's kind of the punchline. I know we're out of time, um, but stay tuned for April 24th because what I would like to do and what I'm asking is I will invite George Savage literally to the table as the representative of finance committee on the table for the council study session with me and council and the community to roll this out, if you will. Okay, well, well thank you very much uh, for that and, um, and for the study session and in inviting me and I, I would encourage everyone else to show up. Uh, to see what's going on at that session. These are all very important topics. 
uh, before we adjourn, any urgent comments or questions from members here? Yeah, just on the election, you're, you're saying this November is too oh, early. Yes, thank you for that point. So what I'm asking for, what I think we need to do, my recommendation is be that we hold a special election. It would be a special election in calendar year 25, most likely November of 25. The only caveat to that, a special election, you have to pay for as a town. And so we'd have to look at that. It, there is a cost. It's not millions of dollars, but there is a cost to it. But the fact that it's there's so many things that could be on the ballot measure would be huge, and it would be definitely worth the money that we would invest to do that. Um, and so that would be the recommendation is to have some sort of special election moving forward. You can also piggyback with other towns and other cities if they have a special election as well. So much more to come and to be continued on the 24th for sure. Great. Um, I, I just want to apologize. I wasn't aware that we were on a two hour clock. So um, I, I'm going to ask that we adjourn. Yes. Okay. And then we do that. So it's okay if we go a bit over. Great. Got it. Uh, public comment, please. Anyone in the room? No. Online, I. Oh, Greg? Okay. Got it. Um, David, I only see David stand up and also Rita. So David, can you speak? Absolutely. First of all, I'm, I'll keep it super short. Um, I thought that was an amazing, honest, detailed presentation, if a little scary. Um, and I think we could have another two hour meeting to actually go through these alternatives um, about how all this works. So I'm on board. There's no way to cover it in the last 30 seconds here, but I thought that was great. And I'd like to see us, uh, whether it's the town council session or even another working session before that, deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Rita? Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be quick. Um, parcel taxes. Uh, not everyone in our town pays the parcel taxes. Many people have exemptions. So I, I think we really need to get our, before we start asking the residents for to uh, throw more money into the coffers, we need to get our books in order uh, before even starting that conversation. You know, why, why give people money when they're not managing uh, what they already have? And so it's not, it's not looked upon well, but there are exemptions in town. So I, I think we need to start with that conversation and not just say, oh, all the new people in town can can afford that. So uh, thank you. And uh, I look forward to the next meeting. Thank you, Rita. And, and we all are agreed that we have to get the finances fixed um, and then you know figure this out in parallel, but no, no more revenue until we get the finances fixed. Um, the first step will be the study session that Sharif mentioned, which will be next month. And then I'm sure we'll meet again to talk about this some more. I don't see anyone else 5 30 to 7 with comments. So uh, given the other meeting, uh, the members are waiting outside. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Okay. Second. All right. Uh, we are adjourned at... Um, thank you, everyone.